We all make plans every day, don't we? Some are small plans, some are big plans, some are relatively easy to achieve and other plans perhaps take a little bit more effort and time. Some things we think are absolute plans, where they're certainly gonna happen, and other plans, well, it may not be completely up to us, so we can't be entirely sure. Winston Churchill was said to have once said famously, he who fails to plan is planning to fail. It's meant to be a motivational kind of a speech to get in. If you want to do something, you've got to plan how you're going to do it so that you can get ahead and do it. Maybe you've seen this comic strip before. This is what the brochure offered, a, th a swing that's three times as good as any other swing. Here's what the sales department ordered. Uh, yes, three times, but not three times in the right spot. Here's what the engineer then appropriately designed given the brief that he had. And here's ultimately what was manufactured. And of course, it was manufactured to spec. It was to hang off a branch and uh, it was to be, have two ropes and have a seat, but it didn't function as expected. So when it was installed, this is how the installer modified it so that it did actually work. But you do wonder in the end, what is it what the customer actually wanted? The why is important here. Why? Because they just wanted that sense of freedom, of being on a swing without a care in the world. But the how had somehow got in the way of the ultimate why. Well, as we approach Genesis chapter 1, we're going to be asking those three questions, as most people do as they approach the Bible, particularly here in Genesis. The who, the how, and the why. But we'll see it is less likely about the how and more about the who and the why. So if you've got your Bible there, open up to page 1, Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, and we read, In the beginning. This is an incredible time marker. And normally when I start a sermon series, I want to give people the context in which we're arriving at a particular book of the Bible that we're looking at. Uh, where's the story been so far and what's going on within the culture and how does it mean, what does it mean for us then in our day, our age? But here there is no context. There is nothing. This is the beginning. And in the beginning, there was only God, nothing else, just God. No other gods that might exert an influence over the God that made this creation. There was just Him in the beginning. And what did He then do? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was no big bang, there was no atomic nuclear explosion, fission or fusion or whatever the scientists say. There was simply a word. God said... And it was, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Interestingly, now scientists in our age have decided that there must have been a beginning. Uh, previously, there was no expectation of the beginning, it just creation just was. But now as they look further and further into space, they see that there must have been a beginning because the, earth, the, the universe continues to expand. And so the search is now on to find that beginning and what happened. Well, you only need to open your Bible at Genesis 1 and see that God spoke the beginning into creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth from nothing. Ex nihilo uh, is the term that we use. From nothing, he spoke and there it was. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was out f without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We get the idea that God created this amorphous kind of existence of something. There was just darkness, and there was no form, and it was void. Uh, it had no structure, really. But when we look at this, we see that it's not just God, the Creator, who's there, but we find that there is another one. We see that God's Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. So we see that although we've said God is alone and, and not able to be coerced or influenced by anyone else, we see that He's more than one. Uh, in fact, the Trinity tells us that there is one God in three persons, Father, Son and Spirit. And here, right at the very beginning of the Bible, we meet the Creator God, Father, and also the Spirit of God, 
But where is the sun? Well, if we do a little bit more exploration and we move forward to the New Testament, we can get a, a fuller understanding of what was going on here. If we move into Colossians chapter 1, we read this. For by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him. So here in the beginning, we have God the Father and God the Son through whom all things were created and God the Holy Spirit who's hovering over the face of this creation. We see it's through Jesus. It's a triune activity, Father, Son and Spirit, the creation comes to being. And we see another very important point here in Colossians. It's through Jesus and for Jesus the creation came into being. The creation in which we live is actually not for us. We get an incredible benefit from it. We, we are you like, if you like, tenants within the creation. But the creation was made for Jesus and through Jesus. So we get a much better understanding of the who and the why. Who, it's all about God. God created it and he created it for his son, Jesus, one member of the Trinity, and the how, or the, the why, is that it was for him. It was for Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus. And so then we arrive at day one, Genesis chapter one, verse three. And God said, he just spoke it, didn't need to raise his voice, shout or command. He simply said, let there be light. And there was light. Imagine if we could each do that. Imagine if we could just say something and it would come about. Imagine if I decided I wanted this curtain behind me turned blue and I just said, be blue, and it was blue. Wouldn't that be absolutely incredible? And I'm sure if you had that incredible absolute power, you could think of a lot of things that you would speak into existence. And it'd probably be chaotic if we all had that opportunity, which in that case, I'm very glad it's only God who can do that, who can speak, and it just is. And here we see his incredible power that he speaks and light was created. But interestingly, here at this point, we realise there is nothing that is giving that light, uh, or certainly not in the created realm that has been created. There's no candle that's been created. There's no flame that's been created. There's, there's, there's no sun or moon. There's no electricity or light bulb. There just was light we find out that the sun, moon and stars aren't actually created until day four. So what is giving forth this light? Well, again, if we jump into the New Testament and we look particularly at John's Gospel, John's Gospel is beautiful at helping us explore and understand the creation story. In John chapter one, we read this in verse four, in Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus himself is the life-creating force that is coming into existence and that life is the light that is happening. So as God creates the light and separates the light from the darkness, we, we shouldn't think about it as a, as a light that we experience that's, that's tangible and, and, and lights things up, but rather the very essence of life as expressed in light. And so we see later on that light, the sun giving light, becomes a symbol or a sign to the very life that is found in Jesus. So we continue on in verses 4 of Genesis chapter 1. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. So he pulls apart the light and the darkness that existed within creation. He pulls them apart. He separates them out. And he looks at the light and he says, the light is good. And this might be reading a little bit too much into it just yet, but he doesn't declare about the darkness. If the light is good, the darkness seems to be an absence of the light or an absence of his sun. And that is not good. Uh, but the light, Jesus being the light of life, is good. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. In John chapter 9, again, John giving a beautiful explanation of light and darkness. We read this from verse 4. Jesus said, 
we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus wasn't talking about the sun's about to set, you know, so hurry up and do the work that you need to do. The concept was while Jesus, the very one through whom the world was created and that life was given into the world, while Jesus is in the world, he's the light of the world. But shortly darkness is going to come, which is the very thing that we know happened at his death. And there was that darkness. Uh, physically, the sign of that was the very sun going black and darkness covered the face of the earth from midday through till three o'clock as a symbol of that darkness having arrived as the light of the world had been killed and died on the cross. And then we arrive at day two. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. So day one, he separated light from darkness. Day two, he's separating water from water. The water above, the sky, that's where that water stays. And the water below, uh, that's uh, the, the seas in which we have. And that's where that stays. And he creates these two realms of sky and of sea. And so we get this beautiful picture of these separations to create order then. And God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then we reach the third day. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. I love the beautiful poetry that comes through in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, and it was so and it was good. And God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. Time and again, we get this refrain, which is a beautiful picture of the Hebrew poetry that is being written here, not as a scientific document about the how, but rather a, a song, if you like, about the who, that is God, and the why for his son's own purpose and pleasure. And so I don't think we should expect that this answers all of the scientific questions that we might have. It doesn't answer the how. It doesn't answer that whether it's 24-hour period or whether it's a seven days or seven epochs. It, does, it simply doesn't answer that. Could God have created the world in seven days? Absolutely. He could do it in seven seconds, even less. Uh, but here, I think the poetic nature of it indicates that it's seven epochs, whether those are 24-hour periods or not 24-hour periods, I really, I don't care. And I know for people this is a very important matter and some people can get very concerned that uh, they're not reading what the Bible actually says here. We'll get onto that in just a little bit as we look a little bit further into Genesis chapter 2. But meanwhile, here we are in the third day, verse 10. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and God saw that it was good. It's good. And God said that the earth sprout vegetation, plants and trees and seeds and fruit according to its kind on the earth and it was so. So here on the third day the earth comes to form as the seas are pulled together into their different locations. The earth is formed and growth begins, plant life begins. And so here is the third realm that existed and was created. And there was evening and there was morning, the end of the third day. And so if somebody asks you, what are the days of creation? What did God actually do in each realm of creation, each epoch of a creation? You can say, well, in the beginning, it was God. That was it before the beginning. And then he created the three realms. Uh, he separated light and darkness. He separated the waters. And then he gathered the waters together in order to create the land. So separation, separation, gathering to create the three realms. And then in turn, we see that he creates the residence of those three realms. Uh, day one, light and darkness. The residence of light and darkness are sun, moon and stars. Uh, day two is the sky and the sea. And the residence happened then on day five, which is the birds and the fish. And then day three is the existence of the land forming and the residence then in day, sorry, day three. And then day six here is the, the residence of the land, which are the beasts and the creepy crawlies. And finally, humanity, which we'll look at in our next sermon. And then we see the seventh day comes into existence. And the seventh day is a day of rest and it is a day without end. 
Day one, two, three, four, five, six had a beginning and an end, but day seven, there's no end, certainly not specified in the Genesis story of creation, which makes us think, are we in the seventh day now? But more about that when we reach the third sermon about that rest day and the day without end. And so we see this Genesis story is answering the question, the who, the how and the why, but more about the who and the why. Who? It is God. The why? For his son's glory and for his son's purpose. The how? God simply speaks it into existence and that is what it becomes. Well, you might remember our story with the little comic strips and we see uh, here that uh, when any two or three or four or five or six people get together, they have a different mind. There's some who are creative, there's some who are engineer types, that's me, and there are some who are installers and tradies and so forth, and ultimately there's the customer. And each step of the way, there's a misunderstanding about the plan. But you don't find that in God. He is one God, and he has one plan, which will not ever be fraught with error. God's plan is consistent and it is good as God himself declared it to be right the way through Genesis chapter 1. He is eternal, that is he was there from the beginning. He's omnipotent, that is he's all powerful and he just speaks and it comes into being. He is triune, father, creator, son, through whom all things were created, and the Spirit, who at this stage is hovering over the face of the earth, and yet he is one God who creates from nothing, ex nihilo, and gives it order and structure for his good purpose. Well, I look forward to Genesis, uh, the second series in Genesis, which is the beginning part two, where we'll explore days four, five, six, and seven, and then beyond. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the delight that it is. I thank you that we don't try and understand our perception of what your creation is through your word, but rather we come to an understanding of what creation is through your word. Help us to come to your word with an open heart to you and your purposes, your existence, your power, your creativity and your purpose. And Father, we thank you for this creation story that might not answer all of our questions, but rather gives forth a good, deep understanding of who you are, how you exist, and your being in your creative purposes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.